boom, put your 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 boom, A side, B side, what side are you on? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I sure would like to make a podcast. I've got so much to say about blank. Well, if you haven't heard about Anchor, you really should. It is the easiest way to make a podcast and it's absolutely free. All right, I'm going to tell you why it's so easy. Okay, so with Anchor, there's creation tools that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many others. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Trust me, I'm so excited about this. You can be too. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. All right, welcome back to another A-Side, B-Side. Adam, we missed you last week. Yes, my Apologies for my uh, absence. I know um, you were a little under the weather. We're, we hope you're feeling better. It was not COVID. So <laughs> Thank goodness. No, no, no COVID here. I'm COVID free. Uh, but yes, I, I was an unexpected absence. Uh, at least I did let Brooke know. So it was not a no call, no show. Uh, You'd have been fired. So yeah, no, that's that's the rule. No call, no show. You done. <laughs> Although I have I have worked some places where it takes four of those before you actually leave. Yeah. So when yeah, you're no. when you're that person, you're like, thank goodness. And when you're the other people that are like impacted by you're like, whoa, 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 we need to uh cut these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I was literally like that gif of John Travolta from Pulp Fiction just looking around like is, is no one going to do something about this? No. Oh, oh okay. This, so this, this you're one of the three people that says GIF. Oh, am I? Is it GIF? That's the internet argument. I say GIF. Oh, um, I from now on will just go one of those short moving pictures. <laughs> one of those talkies from the TVs. Oh my gosh. I don't know if you heard it last week, but I mentioned that Mountain Dew has come out with a cookbook this week and they've got breakfast foods, they've got desserts, they've got different drinks. So I figured you might want to check that out. I know you're not really a cook, but this might be the cookbook for you since you are such a Mountain Dew fan. Yeah, no, I, I definitely will look at all of those drinks. I, I don't understand what you mean by food because isn't Mountain Dew in a meal in itself? It's like the new soup. Ew. No, I think you're supposed to like add it to your eggs or your French toast or your cake or something. You see, it would be a very short cookbook for me. It'd be like for breakfast, 20 ounce Mountain Dew. For lunch, <laughs> maybe a 12 ounce Mountain Dew. <laughs> for dinner, try pairing a two liter with some vodka. Oh gosh. Can you put some food in there? I mean, vodka is often made from potatoes. All right. So it's, uh... it's basically a vegetable. <laughs> so this week i want to say uh, hello to ella b who started following us on instagram and ella has recommended a show for me i've only gotten the first episode in and it is insanely crazy it's called carmel who killed maria marta and it's the story of maria marta garcia belsunce and holy cow it's it's not in spain i think it's buenos aires so it's all in spanish and it's subtitled but it is so crazy and it's it's a real who like you start to suspect everyone and i'm only one episode in there's four episodes and uh <laughs> the first episode i don't want to give any spoilers away all i'm gonna say is when you hear the word petuto you'll go oh right right uh oh yeah so that's something that I'm going to finish up this week because I am obsessed with it now. So thank you, Ella. Also, yeah. HBO has a new one. Start. It's called Murder on Miracle Beach. or No, excuse huh. me, Murder on Middle Beach. Murder on Middle Beach. And it's a young man telling the story of the death of his mom. It's a documentary. And I believe he started it for school and every week a new episode comes out. So it's only been the first episode. If you are a This Is Us fan, yay, because that's been back for a couple of weeks. So break out your tissues because I am all about some This Is Us. And this week's episode is hilarious because Sterling Brown dances with no shirt on. So ladies, fellas, you might Sounds like that Sounds very too. funny. Yeah. Super funny. So funny. <laughs> Don't be jealous. 
<laughs> uh, also checking out the teacher it's an fx show made for hulu and it is uh, steamy and scandalous is that the one with is that the one with kate mara yes it oh, is. okay yeah i've seen i've seen pre like i think they're called commercials where they show you a little bit of the show and they want you to watch it uh uh-huh. and it, it yeah steamy steamy definitely seems to be the thing i it oof. I do not envy. I'm not saying it's right because it is not right. It is not okay. I don't envy teachers <laughs> in high school. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, and college. I mean, and college. It's it's just no. Nope. <laughs> yeah, and there, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know hormones and human chemicals and yeah, danger. Danger, Danger Will, Will Robinson. Robinson. Danger. Yes. Nick Robinson actually is the young man, the male lead oh. in this. And you might know him. Danger from Nick Robinson. Love Ro- uh, Love Robinson. Love Simon. He was the lead in Love Simon. Hmm. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, something fun. Oh, Adam, you, as, especially as a theater guy, I think you would love this one. A holiday movie, Jingle Jangle. Yeah, no, I've seen I've seen the the commercials for that too. It looks really good. It looks it's, really fun and light and kind of exactly what we need right now. Oh, because it's so good. The I mean, world feels heavy. It's gonna totally put you in your feels and it's gonna give you some like I said kind of Hamilton vibes and someone else said greatest showman vibes, and I can see both. And actually the music is written by the people yeah. that did the music for Greatest Showman. So it's incredible. Mm-hmm. And seeing like a legend like Forrest Whitaker take on a singing role is great. And you've got Keegan Michael Key, who and I love. He's a phenomenal yes. dude. He is super underrated. I had the, the luxury of working an event like five years ago at the Fitzgerald Theater here in St. Paul. It's a local, like an NPR thing called Wits. And it's sort of a it was a variety show. It's no longer on the air but he was the like main guest Mm -hmm. and you knew he was funny, but like he's an incredibly talented individual just from a storytelling perspective, a singing perspective, Mm -hmm. a commanding the stage. It makes, it does not shock me at all that he can dance. You know, it just, it's one of those things where like, sometimes you forget that these many actors and, and celebrities were probably the kid in their high school who like did it all. You know, and yeah. at one point they danced, they sang, you know, they were in Oklahoma, you know, and now they're like the bad guy in an action movie. But it he is incredibly talented and it's cool to see him being able to do some things that aren't just comedy. Uh, and I hope it, I hope he continues to do it. I got to interview him a few years back. And I mean, talk about a genuinely, like you said, a genuinely funny dude, but I mean, genuinely just yeah. personable. And a lot of times, you know, when you get to do these interviews, they're not always what you think. And sometimes you're disappointed. He has, he, to this day has been one of my favorite interviews ever. Big fan. I, Big I'm fan. trying to remember who it was. It was somebody. So this is granted. My memory is not good, but we're going back like 12 years we didn't get to interview a lot of people, but we had one interview where the person was definitely given a script of what they wanted to talk about. And when asked any question, they would just refer back to the thing they were supposed to say about the movie or the thing they were promoting. So you'd be like, so how are you doing today? I'm really great, but you know what is also great? This movie that I made. And it was just nonstop that and it got really awkward. So sometimes it could be really ungenuine. I'm trying to remember who that was. I have no idea. I'm never, I, I don't know. I mean, it's only been 12 years, bro. Come on. <laughs> I, I, and I'm not trying to be conceited, but I have no idea because it's been 12 years and I've talked to quite a few people since then. <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't talked to that many people. So you think I'd be the one that remembers. But also, like, I am absolutely horrible at remembering things that matter. However, if you want to know, like, the name of the, so this happened this week. Somebody was talking about a show they were watching and it was like, oh, it, it's got that guy who was in Game of Thrones who helped the, the one kid in the woods. And I'm like, oh, his character was named Jojen Reed. And everyone's like, why do you know that? And I'm like, I do not know. I don't know his name, but I know the character's name. You know the character's name. Yeah. So I remember just the stuff that isn't important, which is not helpful. <laughs> 
real quick before we jump into things. I have one more, two more things. Okay, so you know we have um, buy me a coffee. It's uh, it's mm-hmm. similar to Patreon, but instead of Patreon, it's buy me a coffee. And last week we had your buddy Ryan uh, buy us some yes. coffee. And this you, morning, Ryan. yes, this morning I woke up to coffee from my daughter, my oldest. So my sweet baby girl, Aww. thank you so much. That she, her only stipulation was not Starbucks because she knew I would immediately go to Starbucks probably this morning, but she said no Starbucks. So I didn't get Starbucks. So what is it like? Like she wanted you to get like gas station coffee or maybe just something more bang for my buck. No, that's fair. <laughs> but it was just, the I'm just usually when there's like a don't do this, there's a do this, you know? Yeah. But I think it was just more bang for my buck. I don't know. But it, regardless, it was just a very sweet sentiment that she did that. Yes. So I was, I so, was like, oh. so clearly the, the clock is ticking my children who don't listen to this podcast. But still. <laughs> and also thanks. Uh, we got some new listeners in Brownstown, Indiana in Arley, Montana. Okay. Yeah. I've heard Montana is gorgeous. Wasn't Post Malone hanging out in Montana? Didn't he get a... I know Kanye I mean, had a ranch not, somewhere, but I think Post Malone had a, yeah. a ranch out there too. I wouldn't be surprised. He's not returning my texts currently. I think we're in a fight. Oh, well. All right. Also, yeah. uh, Jackson, Michigan. Thank you to Jackson, Michigan. Hanover, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Uh, Seattle, Washington. What's up? That's the home of Starbucks. So Yeah. So maybe we shouldn't badmouth Starbucks. I didn't badmouth. That could that could be Starbucks royalty right there. I I never badmouth Starbucks. I said more bang for your buck. Starbucks knows they're expensive. They're good. They're expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news: Bro- broken on the A side B side podcast. Starbucks is expensive. <laughs> Uh, let's see what's up in Italy. We've got listeners out in Italy. Thank you. Also, and oh, awesome. I hope I say this correctly, Valais, Switzerland and uh, Upper Austria. So thank you guys so much. That's outstanding. I know. Loving it. All right. So this week we're going to jump into it. It's going to be the B-side first. This is Kevin Armstrong, your host for Movie Battle. Each episode, we take two films and put a super fan of each against one another to decide which one is best. The only rule we have is that you come correct. If you're interested in being a guest on Movie Battle, please check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. All right, so we did a poll a few weeks ago, so just kind of going in order of the polls. So we started with the Internet's First Killer, and then last week, Adam, we had the Socialite Slayer or the Slaughtering Socialite. Killer Candy is what we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And this week, we have the real-life Hannibal the Cannibal. (sighs) I was going to be him for Halloween if it didn't get canceled. Were you? I don't think you were going to be him. You would have been Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Hannibal Lecter. But I even bought like a like a mask that looks like the mask he wears when he's with the orange jumpsuit at the beginning. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, but then Halloween get canceled. So COVID. Now I just have a really creepy mask that I don't know what to do with. I mean, just take some pictures. You could, you know, just take pictures and have fun. Do a fashion show with your mask. Yeah, just, yeah, just add those to my Instagram. I'll be like, <laughs> hashtag why. <laughs> so I've said this before for this podcast. I am drawn to stories that I've never heard before. Uh, you know, with mm. the exception of Rodney Alcala, there are so many stories that deserve attention and this one is no exception. So I came mm. across this story in an online group and it's one that's really sticking with me. From the different articles I've deep, dive in, d- deep dived into, like on the Guardian website, he went by many well-earned nicknames such as blue and spoons we'll get to those later don't laugh because (laughs) when you hear why he's called those you won't think they're they're they're, yeah they're nothing to laugh at i'm like really holding back the old school quote here so don't do it the brain eater and most notably hannibal the cannibal now i've never seen the tv show dexter but what i do know about it which I don't think is a spoiler since it seems to be the premise of the show is that Dexter is a serial killer, but only kills the bad guys. Yeah. And he works as a, as a crime scene cleanup guy. 
Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. So his nickname- So I mean, really just burning the candle on both ends. <laughs> so his nickname is Hannibal the Cannibal, but maybe it should be Dexter Lecter. Hmm. Like it seems more fitting. Okay. You get it? Dexter. Okay. I- anyway. All right. So this is the story. I'm with you. I like the alliteration. <laughs> This is the story of Robert Maudsley. So Robert's story seems to start the same way most serial killers do. It seems they either had a rough start to life or a serious head injury. And in this case, it's a rough start. So Robert was born June 26th of 1953 in Speaky, Speaky, England. He was the fourth in line of 12. And if you are from Speaky or Speaky, please, I'm sorry, send me an email correct me. I apologize. So while under the age of two, Robert and his three older siblings, Paul, Kevin, and Brenda were all taken out of their parents' home due to parental neglect. So Robert's early years were spent at Nazareth House, which is a Roman Catholic orphanage in Crosby, Merseyside, England. So this was a 1950s Catholic orphanage. So it's exactly as you'd expect. It was run by nuns. Uh-huh. I, I, I think like Sound of Music when I'm thinking of this. I know they didn't go to an orphanage, but you know, like the nuns. Yeah, they're they're in the, the, the nunnery and they're like, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Right. You know, at least send her to live with Nazis. It's weird. <laughs> well, all right, that's a good turn. So um, <laughs> <laughs> during their time at Nazareth, Robert and his siblings grew really close together because, I mean, they're in this really traumatic situation, which for them, it's traumatic, but at the same time, the nuns were really wonderful and they Mm -hmm. actually recall it as being happier times in their life. So the children's parents, George and Jean, would visit on occasion. And while Robert and his siblings were at Nazareth, his parents had eight more children remember i said he was a fourth in line of 12 and i don't know a lot about the rules of orphanages especially in the 1950s but doesn't that seem a little weird that the parents get the kids taken away but still get the visit i guess so maybe i don't know well i mean if you think about kids like in foster care and stuff they get taken away and they still get to visit that's right again my ignorance is showing so (laughs) so i guess the parents decided that eight was enough so robert Paul, Kevin, and Brenda end up back home with their parents. Things went from relatively good at the orphanage. Like I said, they remembered it as happy times to really pretty bad at home. Paul's, his uh, older brother, recalls a time at the orphanage saying, we had all got on really well. Our parents would come and visit, but they were strangers. The nuns were our family and we all used to stick together. Then our parents took us home and we were subjected to physical abuse sadly robert for whatever reason seemed to catch the majority of the abuse robert actually recalled in an interview with the guardian he said all i remember of my childhood is the beatings once i was locked in a room for six months and my father only opened the door to come in beat me four to six times a day he used to hit me with sticks once he busted a 22 rifle over my back While Robert's mom didn't actively participate in the beatings of her children, she did encourage them. Mm. Robert said of his mom, our ma instigated half of it. If we went to the shops instead of coming straight home, she would bring it to dad's attention and he would beat us. I think they were equally to blame. In my eyes, a mother is supposed to protect her children. This story, I'm just gonna tell you, yes, Robert Maudsley is a serial killer. But like I said in the beginning, you know how Dexter kills the bad guys? Yeah. This is a story of like, my heart aches for this dude, even though he's like a, a bad person. Mm-hmm. You'll, you'll see. So Robert, once again, is taken from the home and he's placed into the foster care system. George tells the family, George, his father, tells the family that Robert's dead. So a liar and an abuser. Okay. Mm-hmm. Control. At the age of 16, Robert leaves his foster home and he makes his way into London where he developed an addiction to drugs and he spent time in and out of psychiatric hospitals due to repeated suicide attempts. On more than one occasion, he admitted to doctors that 
voices were telling him to kill his parents. So Robert begins working as a rent boy to support his drug addiction. Now, you might not know what a rent boy is. It's a male sex worker who usually has other men as clients. Mm -hmm. So things for Robert escalate in 1973 when he's in his early 20s. He commits his first murder. Laborer John Farrell was a client to Robert. For whatever reason, during conversation, John shows Robert pictures of several children that he had abused, which Mm -hmm. angered Robert deeply. In a rage, he garroted John, which remember, we talked about that before. It's the wire around the neck. The murder was so violent and torturously slow that John, Robert's victim, turned blue, hence his nickname. Mm -hmm. Blue. Blue. You still want Was to do the there... movie quote? No, he is not my boy. <laughs> um, was there any indication as to why, like, was this a, a, a grot that he, that was just a founder? Did he have it with him? Was it for protection or? It, it doesn't really say. Uh, I mean, okay. he seems to be crafty. He's, he's living in the streets. Yeah. You know, he's a sex worker. I mean, I'm sure. could be, yeah, just yeah. for my own safety. Right. So Robert was arrested and deemed unfit to stand trial and sent to Broadmoor Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where it was recommended that he should never be released. Okay. He resided there for about three years. In 1977, while still at Broadmoor, Robert commits his next murder. Mm -hmm. Robert, along with another inmate, David Chessman, excuse me, David Cheeseman, dragged a third inmate, David Francis, into another room on their ward and held him hostage by barricading the door. They tied him up with a cord from a record player and tortured him. Now, David, their victim, was a child molester, and they knew this. They tortured him for nine hours in full view of the guards through a window. The culmination of that torturous attack came when Robert jammed a spoon through David's ear into his brain, earning Robert the nickname Spoons due to the spoon left hanging. Whoa. So even though Robert was a resident of of Broadmoor, he this time was found fit to stand trial and was convicted of manslaughter and sent to Wakefield Prison, a.k.a. Monster Mansion. So upon arriving at Wakefield, Robert learned that his reputation was already well known. It it preceded him. This Mm -hmm. prison is where Robert earned his most notable nickname of Hannibal, the cannibal. Hmm. So on July 29th of 1977, Robert, who was rumored to want to kill seven people, embarked on his next spree. First, Salmi Darwood, who was convicted of killing his wife. Robert manages to lure Salmi into his cell, slit his throat, and hide his body under his bed. Then Robert searches for his next victim. It was not an easy task because these prisoners were terrified of Robert, as well they should have been. But he does find Mm -hmm. another victim in Bill Roberts, who was convicted of sexually assaulting a seven-year-old girl. Robert makes a a makeshift knife and hacked into Bill's skull, then bashed his head against the wall. I guess I should have given a uh, disclaimer. Content warning? Yeah, content warning. I'm sorry. Content warning. (laughs) Better late than never. (laughs) I mean, unless, unless this is somebody's first episode listening to a true crime podcast, I you know going in, there's likely of it getting a little uh, getting a little graphic. Unless so, the unless the true crime is like true IRS crimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> After the second attack, Robert calmly walks into the wing office. Each wing has a central office where the staff is located. So he walks into the wing office and he placed the homemade knife on the desk and told the guards that they would be too short for roll call that evening. Dude, if this was an action movie, if this was an action movie, that's, that's when the audience would be like, yeah! 
but this is yeah no that's that's that is a that is an impressive line is a very disturbed individual but that is a a well delivered line i'm sure seriously if that was bruce willis the audience would be like yeah bruce but in real life that's scary af yeah yeah but again i'm i'm conflicted right now because he's just dispatching bad people that's what i'm telling you that's why this story is like oh my goodness but wait just just wait doesn't make him a good person i know that i know that's why there's the conflict the inner turmoil so robert was convicted of double murder and deemed too dangerous to be in general population around others ever he's considered (laughs) to be he's considered to be britain's most dangerous prisoner in all of britain okay this dude oh my gosh and like you said he's just dispatching bad guys but that doesn't make him a good guy like yeah no (sighs) okay and it's not like he's just in the perfect place where bad guys are literally being dropped on his doorstep right or right cell step i know i know i'm okay so robert who is deemed too dangerous can't ever be released can't be out in gen pop So he is sent back to Wakefield prison and placed in solitary confinement. But this isn't like regular solitary confinement. Or if you watch like, if you watch like Wentworth, he's not in, he's not being slotted. Or if you watch Orange is the New Black, he's not in the shoe. This is like a completely different thing. He has a special cell made for him. Think Hannibal Lecter style, even though this mm-hmm. was built seven years before Silence of the Lamb. I do think they took uh. some inspiration from this. The cell, which is located in the deepest parts of the prison, has been nicknamed the Glass Cage. According to Lanks Live, it is five, five and a half meters by four and a half meters, which is 18 by 14 feet. It has a large bulletproof yeah. window. Not, got, doesn't get a lot of room. No. So it has a large, it has large bulletproof windows, which the guards are able to monitor him through. The only furniture in the cell is a table and a chair made of compressed cardboard. And both his toilet and sink are bolted to the floor. His bed is a concrete slab and the door is made of solid steel, which opens into a cage just inside. The cage itself is enclosed in thick see-through acrylic panels and has a small slit at the bottom, which is where the guards pass him his meals and other essential items. His only free time is one hour each day for exercise. He's confined for the other 23. When he is let out for exercise, he's escorted by six guards and he's never allowed any contact with any other inmates. In an interview, Robert says he feels tormented in solitary confinement. He said, there is a lack of hope. I don't appear to have anything to look forward to. I think an officer could stop and talk a bit, but they never do. And it's these thoughts that I think about most of the time. Robert also said that the guards only seem to be concerned with getting him back into his cell as quickly as possible. In 2000, an attempt for some sort of companionship, he begged for a relaxing of his imprisonment. He asked for either a cyanide capsule to take his own life or for a pet budgie. A pudgy, I mean, a budgie is a bird. It's a parakeet here in America. Okay. So the capsule- He wanted a pet bird. Yeah, he wanted a parakeet, which I mean, I had a parakeet growing up. It's, I mean, it's a mini parrot, really. Both the capsule request and the budgie request were denied. Robert is not allowed a television, a record player. We see what he can do with those. Or anything yeah. <laughs> like that. According to Liverpool Echo, a nun who remembered Robert from Nazareth House said, I never thought of him as awkward or troublesome. I certainly do not remember him as being insane. If anything, he's one of the better behaved boys. I am so sad to hear what became of him. The Guardian website says there's been a campaign to improve Robert's quality of life on the grounds that his treatment could lead to further mental breakdown and is a breach of human rights. Robert has said that he was raped as a child and that early abuse left deep psychological scars. He has also been quoted as saying, if I had killed my parents in 1970, none of these other people would have died. Robert Maudsley is still incarcerated 
and will be until the day he dies. And that is the story of the real life Hannibal, the cannibal. And now you see why I'm so conflicted <laughs> because he is not yeah, a good person I mean, by any means. Bad, bad guy. He's had, and the fact I mean, that he's a serial killer, he's had four victims. They were all either wife abusers, child abusers, but he's not a, but it, he's a, he's a murderer. So you're like, but you're a murderer. I mean, you killed the bad guys, but you're a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, we're not just like talking about killing. There was the one where they were tortured for 12 hours. Like there, there's some extracurricular to level be fair, of vigilante. It was only so, nine. Don't okay. add three hours. Well, I was, I'm sorry. I, it's se- it was only 75% as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> I retract 25% of my statement. <laughs> I mean, but it does bring up a really interesting, like, if you look at it, and this has been something that people have pointed out about action movies or vigilante stories or superhero movies, we, as a society, like to cheer on those people that punish the bad people, Mm -hmm. even though sometimes they're doing bad things as well. Right. So it it does make it very frustrating. Because I I do, do I feel badly about any of the people that he killed i don't know that i do i'm gonna say it. was it wrong that he killed them yeah was it wrong that he killed them yeah in a perfect world would we all allow justice to happen but like what is the one thing you always hear about inmates and that one type of person that they do not abide Mm -hmm. people who hurt children yep I mean, maybe that's a urban legend, but this sure seems to fit with that. And I feel sorry for the condition he is in. Yeah, I really, that's the thing. It's like, it does seem like prison is not like, you know, supposed to be a a field trip, but it seems, it does seem inhumane. I mean, no television. I get the record player, get me. I I understand that one. Yeah, yeah. No television, no, I'm, you know, I mean, he's just in a cell for 23 hours a day. It, it feels it feels like an undue level of extreme reaction. Like, I feel like within the same, and maybe I'm wrong here because I do not know the statistics of murders within British uh, prisons over the last 30 years. But I feel like there have been other people that have killed more than four people in prison. I think it's- But I don't way... know that any of them, yeah, it's, you know, the nine hours of torture and the- well that and i think it's just he almost comes off as methodical about it and maybe that's why he's considered the most dangerous because you're right i'm sure there have been other people that have killed i mean the majority of his murders took place in prison yeah 75 percent actually of his murders yeah took place in prison. back to that 75 percent <laughs> the magic number it seems <laughs> but i think it's just because he is so methodical about it seeking out and there there has to be a a me and in my personal opinion it feels like there was probably also a media or public outcry perception that these stories somehow got some attention to the point where they felt like we need to do something overall that was above and beyond different from everything else because you this think is so because i feel like if most people heard uh, what he did and the people that he killed, they'd be like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah, but also it could be more the, again, I'm completely theorizing here. I don't know. Uh, but I could see where the prisons may be like, hey, everyone's mad at us because this guy keeps, they're like, why can't you stop this guy from killing people? And they were like, we have, uh, this is what we'll do. We stop him. Look. And now he's in a glass case, you know, maybe all the time. But I mean, I mean, what- honestly, when you describe that, it feels exactly like the movie. Like, they, yeah. Like they stole it like image for image. I wouldn't be surprised. I I really think the movie was very highly influenced by this. I mean, Hannibal Lecter in the movie didn't kill just bad guys. He killed anybody. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying the the cell itself seems like it was very highly influenced by this. Oh, very much. See, now that's your side. That's what you can figure out. (laughs) <laughs> this has how that happened no like if it was influenced you can figure out if the movie was influenced by this 
Oh, that's cool. Huh? Yeah, I already have next week's uh, segment. Then see, that's a whole episode. A whole episode, like no, you say. Whole another episode. A whole another episode, like you say. <laughs> and we will. <laughs> <laughs> you won't. You'll forget, and then I'll ask you, and you go, "Oh, I was supposed to look that up, huh?" Yeah, that's that's. But you know, at least I'd be on brand because it's consistent. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That is the B side. All right, we just talked about the real life Hannibal Lecter and his glass case of emotion that he has been, well, a literal glass case that he has been encased in in England and how the movie uh, Silence of the Lambs may have been influenced or the book that the Silence of the Lambs it is based was. on may have been influenced by that. I just looked it up and yes, it is actually oh, okay. influenced by that. So we have the answer. So now you don't even have to forget your homework for next week now i don't even have to forget my homework but in one of the grand lovely serendipitous moments the movie i'm going to talk about tonight has also been accused of being influenced by other things almost to the point of plagiarism now i don't know if there have ever been any plagiarist uh accusations for the silence of the lambs the story of hannibal lecter the character versus hannibal Lecter, the actual British dude who's trapped in a basement and hasn't seen TV in like 40 years. Dude, if he ever gets a TV, his mind's going to be blown. Completely. Like that, it, it's, it, he's going to just be like, what? Do you so, think I mean, they would show maybe him? Maybe it's good. The movie Hannibal Lecter, uh, you know, Silence of the Lambs, do you think they would show him that or Dexter? Oh, I think that that would act. Can you have, like, so we're at a weird place from entertainment standpoint in uh, the pandemic world, but do you know how many people would pay to watch the guy named, nicknamed Hannibal Lecter, watch a movie for the first time about Hannibal Lecter? Oh, uh, I would. Like, totally we could just it. put a camera on his face and just, like, double screen it. You know, do one of those reaction videos from YouTube. Right, forget YouTube like, reaction I would videos. Pay I want and, that. Yeah. And, like, the funny thing is he'd probably just not react the entire time. Or because he's, he's a so you know, sociopath and a psychopath. Well, and also, like, I feel like the British are very mannerable and very polite. So he'd say something like, oh, lovely, isn't it? <laughs> or it appears that they've stolen my life. What a shame. That's, <laughs> and then he'd be like, that's bollocks. Excuse is my that, language. Is that me on the telly? <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Also, a uh, apology to all of our British yes, listeners for our horrible for accents. Both of, for both of our horrible accents, and assuming everyone talks like they are from a BBC show from like 1973. <laughs> but I think it'd be really cool to see Hannibal watch Hannibal or watch Silence of the Lambs and see his reaction. But we're not talking about Hannibal. However, the movie we are talking about has been accused of plagiarism. And I didn't even realize that when I started to look this up for last week's episode. So, uh, in. The U.S., we have, as Brooke, I'm sure you're, you're aware, we've recently had an election. No! And it's uh, been kind of, I know, right? I don't, in case anybody missed it, I just wanted to let them know. Uh, it happened a couple weeks ago. And I have always been fascinated by politically themed movies. And I have dove into everything from your more comic styles with your Dave or uh, The Distinguished Gentleman, which is an underrated Eddie Murphy movie, uh, all the way to things that are more intense, like a lot of the spy novels, uh, any of the Tom Clancy stuff usually has to do with the presidency, uh, Air Force One, where Harrison Ford looking at the terrorists and saying, get off my plane, and then, you know, getting them off his plane, spoiler alert. Right. Love all of those. But one political movie that I have had always been fascinated about from the point I heard about it when I was in high school was an older political movie, one that I did not come out in my lifetime, but starred one of my favorite actresses ever. And in fact, got her an Academy Award. So back in 1962, there was a film that starred Angela Lansbury, who is arguably the greatest, and Frank Sinatra and Janet Lee. So it was called The Manchurian Candidate. And I had read about this movie and wanted to find it and finally found it on DVD when I was in college. And it had just come back out on DVD because I think it was about to be remade as it was in 2004. So it came out on DVD and I have loved this movie ever since I saw it in, I think, 2000 and it is in my opinion one of the most underrated political thrillers 
and it also holds up. So I watched it last week, and I, I will tell you the 1962 version holds up incredibly well. So the plot centers on this character who is a Korean War veteran, and his name is Raymond Shaw, and he was played by Lawrence Harvey, who I have never seen in anything else because I didn't watch a lot of 1960s movies. But one of his co-soldiers who were prisoners of war during the Korean War is played by Frank Sinatra. Mm-hmm. And I loved the idea of the Brat Pack in high school. And I want, I watched the original Ocean's Eleven and I can sing a lot of Dean Martin songs, not as well as he can, but I love that whole idea. But Frank was always playing Frank in every movie that I saw him. In. However, in The Manchurian Candidate, it is arguably Sinatra's best acting film as well. So not only do you have Angela Lansbury, who is amazing, you have Frank Sinatra giving his best performance ever. So Raymond Shaw is a POW during the Korean War. He gets back to civilian life and his mother works with her husband who is a senator and they are trying to get that senator towards closer to the presidency. Turns out that her son has been brainwashed during his captivity with the, during the Korean War and is a sleeper agent. Mm. He, he then is, if he sees the queen, uh, is it the queen of spades or the queen of hearts? Let me double check. Sorry. I gotta, that one, that's a very important moment. Uh, it is the queen of diamonds, neither the spade or the hearts. If he sees the queen of diamonds played in a card game in a certain order, it will trigger him to then attack his next target. So he goes throughout the movie assassinating people. His mom, we find out, is in on it. Spoiler alert. Sorry, I don't, anybody who hasn't seen the movie, it's worth watching. You probably know what's going to happen, uh, but super smart. Marco tries to figure it out. Marco, played by Frank Sinatra, tries to figure it out. He knows something's wrong because he keeps having this vision, this nightmare of when they were all in captivity in Korea, Raymond Shaw assassinating two other soldiers at the behest of their captors. And he was brainwashed to forget about it. In fact, everyone in the unit was brainwashed to the fact that anytime they are asked about Raymond Shaw, every one of them says the same line. They all respond with, Raymond Shaw is the kindest, bravest, warmest, and most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. When you've got an entire like platoon of people or a squadron of people saying the same thing about one guy, that seems a little far-fetched. Now, I do not have any personal experience, having never been in the military, but Brooke, I know you have. Have you ever been in a unit, and you, we don't need to, to say names, but where you knew that everybody felt the same about one member of the unit, without a doubt? No. Okay. I mean, I can't imagine any group of people that I've ever been in where there was one person that everybody all loved without a doubt. It is just completely unlikely because we are humans and we naturally find fault with each other. And sometimes that fault makes them like them a little bit more, a little bit less, but we never say they're perfect. And we rarely ever say they're the kindest, bravest, warmest, and most wonderful human being I've ever known in all my life. Mm -hmm. So once Marco figures out that he's having these nightmares and one of the other soldiers is having these nightmares and they both pick out from a lineup, the two people that they see both see in their nightmares that are real people within the communist government of Korea, now Army Intelligence, which Marco works for, is interested in figuring out what's going on. I don't want to ruin the entire movie. I've ruined at least at least the first like 45 minutes to an hour. But it goes on from there to uncover an entire conspiracy where they're trying to use the Red Scare of the 1950s and 60s to push other senators out. Uh, there was a, there's a scene which is, I was talking to a friend of mine who's also a movie buff about this the other day. And, he, and as soon as I mentioned the original Manchurian candidate, he's like, the thing with the ketchup. So Angela Lansbury and her husband, the senator, are trying to decide how many senators to accuse of being communists. And they're arguing about what the numbers should be. And then the senator sees the ketchup bottle and decides on 57. Yeah. And it's such a tiny moment, but it's so perfect. And then how completely uh, like made up and obscure and weird all this is. So 
before I ruin the entire movie, uh, Manchurian Jeez, Candidate came alert. out in 1962. I know, I know. Uh, you will find out what happens with Lawrence, Lawrence Harvey's character, Raymond Shaw, and Frank Sinatra's character, Marco, and even their uh, Lawrence or Raymond Shaw's mother, Angela Lansbury, if you watch the entire film. However, I will tell you this, and this is a spoiler alert. Never spend any time watching the 2004 version at all. If wow, you decide you why? want to watch The Manchurian Candidate, do not watch the 2004 version. It takes everything good about the 1962 version and twists it and makes it worse. And the thing is, it has a really, really strong cast and it should be a good movie. I was excited after I had seen the original and I saw this movie was coming out. So in 2004, you've got Liev Schreiber as Raymond Shaw. In the Frank Sinatra role, you have Denzel Washington as the Angela Lansbury role, you have Meryl Streep. Then you have John Voight in it as well. It is set up to be a incredible movie. It falls on its face at every opportunity. Instead of it being a foreign power that is subjugating these soldiers, it is a corporation called the Manchuria Corporation. And all everybody in the unit is implanted with these bugs that it's not hypnotism it just you know it's like basically they turn them into cyborgs and they, they you know get taken over it's just it's poorly done it's a waste of an immense amount of talent and if you're going to spend two hours watch the original manchurian candidate and i always That's ask sad, myself with such why talent in there right and i asked myself why why did this happen why did this movie in 2004 stray so far from the original source material and when I dove into that, it became a little bit more understandable as to why the 2004 movie alters so much of the original content. And that is because, and I did not know this until I looked this up, the original book written by Richard Condon, The Manchurian Candidate, is considered one of the most beloved, but probably plagiarist works Oh. of the last century. There is much of it that is directly taken from a different book called I, Claudius, written in 1934. Um, a linguist actually said, uh, his name was John Olson, he judged that there can be no disputing that Richard Condon plagiarized from Robert Graves, who wrote the original, art, the original uh, novel, I, Claudius. He went on to say that as plagiarists go, Condon is quite creative. He does not confine himself to one source and is prepared to throw ingredients into the plot. One of my favorite authors, Jonathan Lethem, actually gets involved in this entire scenario in an essay that he wrote called The Exity of Influence, a plagiarism. He said, there are many texts which are cherished and the Manchurian candidate is in one of them that become troubling to their admirers after through this discovery of their plagiarized elements, which make it apparent that appropriation, mimicry, quotation, allusion, and sublimated collaboration consists on some kind of sin quora non of the creative act, creative, cutting across all forms and genres in the realm of cultural production. Latham basically saying that imitation is the best form of flattery and cannot be truly separated from any creative work as will always be influenced by that we have read but that this one is so cherished that people have a hard time loving it after they know the plagiarist origin so in the last 15 minutes i have taken you on a bit of a roller coaster i have begged you to watch this 1963 movie i have told you never to watch the 2004 movie which doesn't actually seem to have anything to do with the 1963 source material only to realize that that is because we all have learned that the 1963 source material was not the source at all it was a plagiarized work but an incredibly well done one so in the greatest irony of all the manchurian candidate the book itself is a bit of a Manchurian candidate, for it pretends to be an original work of art and it is nothing but a plagiarized, improved imposter. And that is the A-side. Well, well, well. I never thought you'd I'd hear you say anything bad about Denzel Washington and Meryl Streep. No, they did everything they could with the 
script that they were given. The reason the script is so bad is the studio didn't want to use any of the elements for the first one because they didn't want to get sued. I mean, I understand that. Because at that point, it, it, it yeah. But what's so the point of remaking I, But I didn't it know all. that at the time. You know, like at right. that point. Like, then don't why, remake it at all. Just make a new movie. Yeah. It's like, oh, hey, we, we're going to make some tater tot hot dish, but we don't have tater tots or any meat or cream of mushroom soup. So uh, here's some potatoes and we threw some ham on top and we didn't cook it. <laughs> Enjoy. Tater tot hot dish is, is a northern northern dish for anyone who's listening. It's super delicious, but uh, it's it's definitely cooked. Before we go, I do want to give you one last bit of information back on the B side. Robert Maudsley okay. is the longest serving prisoner in the UK. Think about that. How, and, and forgive me. Forgive Since my asking 1970... for details. How long has he been serving? His first victim was. Let me see. His first first victim was in 1973. So since about 73, 74, when he was first convicted. Yeah. First so he's placed like into not psychiatric that far care. from 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? 50 years is a long time. And most of that in solitary confinement. Yeah, in a glass box without TV and his chair is made of cardboard yes pressed yeah. cardboard his bed is made of stone yeah concrete concrete bed cardboard yeah. desk table i wonder okay uh, what do they do for like okay because he gets served his meals through the slot mm -hmm. does he get utensils i don't think so i think everything's a handheld you think like so? he's, he's not he's not getting spaghetti or if it's he like does, he's oh just hey eat here's it a sandwich yeah that's fair don't they He's have not getting a nice bottle of Chianti either? I can't even do those. <laughs> yeah, there, that's much better. <laughs> but do you think, I mean, don't they have utensils that are made of like, I don't know, those they're they've they've got recycled well, they hadn't haven't had those since the 70s, but I mean nowadays maybe yeah. he's got utensils. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, they they gave the man a cardboard chair. So maybe maybe he gets cardboard utensils. But I got to feel like that. Like, can you imagine a worse, like, experience than be like, hey, here's some spaghetti. Here's a cardboard, like, fork. Oh, fork. <laughs> See how that goes. Yeah. Or spork, probably. Because, it, you know, it's like, fork's got too many prongs. So some it's a spork. Here's a cardboard are, spork. Are really it's some spaghetti. Sharp. Have, have you seen? Not I mean, the one that are... Hannibal's getting. Oh, that's true. That's true. I legit haven't seen a spork in, like, in the wild in like 20 years <laughs> in the wild <laughs> oh man like maybe online or on like in a museum or something but i'm not just like some of it like oh look at this place i have some utensils i could get have you Here's not seen a toy spoon, story 4 a fork i have not Sporky. specifically because of the spork sporky yeah. is a character yeah i know he's a character Gets a nice way of describing it. <laughs> all right. So you can check us out. All sources and photos will be on our website. To Toy Story 3 was the perfect ending, and there was no reason for Toy Story 4. That's why I haven't seen it. I will agree with you, but it was still good to see Tom Hanks. I love Tom Hanks. So As a cartoon. As anything. He's Tom Hanks. He's America's dad. Hey. Yeah. And COVID tried to take him. And they did not succeed. Boom. Take that, right. COVID. <laughs> yeah. um, of course, Tom, all... Tom Hanks is the key. <laughs> all pictures and sources will be on our website, uh, a side, b side, podcast.square.site. Check it out. Of course, you can get with us on our Instagram, which is a side underscore b side underscore podcast. Facebook is a side b side podcasts. And you can also email us because one, we know we did really horrible British accents and I probably mispronounced the city name. So please tell me the proper pronunciation, a side b side podcasts at gmail.com. All right. That's and if you're the one person on earth that really loves Manchurian Candidate from 2004, tell me why. <laughs> all right thanks adam thanks for hey guys i'm kelsey and i'm taylor and we are convinced that if you guys are listening and loving this podcast that you will love our podcast morning mugshot it's a true crime podcast where we cover a new case every Friday. 
and at the end of our episode, we talk about our thoughts, feelings, and opinions on this week's case. If you guys want to come and be our new besties, we can't wait to hear your thoughts, feelings, and opinions on our cases. So feel free to check us out, Morning Mugshot, on Instagram and anywhere you get your true crime podcast. Thank you for joining us for another episode of A-Side, B-Side podcast. We really hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, we'd appreciate it if you'd head on over to Apple and leave us a rating or a review. And make sure you come back next Friday for another episode.